Well, thank you. Thank you, Organizer, for providing the opportunity to present uh, our data as a disclosure. I'm scientific founder Ramon Carlos and a CS of Cold Genesis. And today we'll discuss with you a little bit more about uh, how can we use this on quality vector, how they really work. So when we think about on quality viruses, uh, these are real immunotherapy per se. So what these viruses are really doing are really infecting the cancer cells. Uh, they replicate, and upon replication, they really release uh, all these alarm signals, and I will talk in a bit, which in turn uh, will trigger the activation of NK macrophages and the infiltration of T cells, who are gonna get prime. The T cells initially are going to be recruited because they think there is a viral infection. It is exactly what is happening. But on the other hand, they're gonna get prime to tumor-specific antigen. Uh, and in turn, when everything works like we want it to go, uh, we're gonna have a, uh, the development of a long-term response against uh, uh, cancer cells. So you can see these oncolytic vectors actually as an antigen, totally agnostic uh, cancer vaccine, sort of like the ultimate personalized medicine. As I said, uh, uh, they infect uh, the cancer cells, uh, and upon infection, uh, uh, they have all these different components called pump that naturally trigger all these alarm signals inside of the cells. And you have the release of all these cell debris uh, together with um, ATP, DNA, protein, and uh, one of the key alarm signals like um, HGBM1 uh, that is really called find me signal. This is where the NK macrophages immediately start to get recruited and uh, macrophages start to then um, process uh, all the antigen and if the T cells are in the environment, there is a priming of the T cells in the tumor microenvironment. So as you can imagine, uh, uh, these oncolytic vector have to specifically infect and replicate cancer cells. So um, we know that they do it most of the time by default. We know that cancer cells are exquisitely permissive to vector replication because they miss a lot of pathways uh, that are in turn uh, fundamental to block vector infection. Um, nevertheless, we still want to fully tailor the replication of the virus in terms of safety. So there are different ways to do so. Um, we can uh, uh, remove genes that they are required for the virus to eject on normal cells. Uh, we can engineer structural protein to ensure that the virus infect only through specific receptor that express only in cancer cells. We can even coat the virus, hide the virus from the immune system to avoid any kind of uh, abrogation of vector infection upon uh, neutralizing, the presence of neutralizing antibodies against the virus itself, still retaining the ability though to recognize cancer cells. Uh, we can even use uh, cells like neurostem cells, mesenchymal stem cells to infect them and use these cells as a carrier to deliver uh, the oncolytic vector where the tumor is. Um, there is also another way, so these two levels of tropism, how the virus can find the cancer cells, but the second level of tropism is uh, how the virus can replicate in cancer cells. So how can we ensure that our vector can in fact replicate only in cells, so that they are cancer, I mean, they're cancer cells. So we can use cancer-specific promoter. Um, we can also, take advantage of microRNA, that they are highly expressed in healthy cells and totally absent in cancer cells. This has happened more often what you can think. Most of the microRNA that they are really important for full differentiation of your tissue are really exquisitely high in healthy tissue and virtually absent in cancer cells with a differential of 8,000 to zero. So if you then take uh, any of your key gene of your virus and you engineer in such a way that in the three prime UTI you have the target sequence for that microRNA, that microRNA that is present only in healthy tissue will fully abrogate the replication of your virus in studying cancer cells where the microRNA is not expressed. Your virus will replicate as well as the wild, uh, as well as the wild type virus. And then uh, there are different other things we can do with this virus. We can arm the virus with cytokine. We can uh, 
how many virus with uh, tumor specific uh, antigen in order to furthermore uh, improve the immune response. Uh, we can use microRNA, arm the virus with microRNA in a different process to uh, hijack the cancer cells. We can use enzyme to improve the spreading of our virion particles and change the tumor microenvironment. Use prodrug by specific antibodies and um, even arm the virus with the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, and the latest uh, kits on the block are these new engineer vector that they are obtained by evolutionary selection, which uh, they seem to be uh, outrageously strong and retain an exquisitely safety, at least in preclinical model. The said, uh, we need to deliver these viruses. So for solid tumor, uh, we normally use an intratumoral injection. And the reason is, uh, otherwise our virus get diluted. <coughs> Um, in five liters of blood. And of course, we can encounter on, uh, way more issues in terms of specificity. Uh, most of the virus that they are deliver IT, HSV, adenovirus vector, polio, vaccine, are also the virus that are exquisitely sensitive to neutralizing antibodies, especially if they, like all of us, already got exposed to these viruses, the chance that our immune system will see them and block them, uh, it happens really often. However, uh, John Bell unlock uh, one uh, of the major issue we had is like, how can we use this virus IV? And he actually showed that even though we have uh, neutralizing antibodies against vaccinia, still we can deliver vaccinia systemically, and it's just a matter of concentration of the virus that we can use. And then there are other ways which can deliver the virus. We can do intraperitoneal, we can intravesical, intrapleural, and intraocular. Um, nevertheless, when we get to the tumor, we are going to face these four different scenarios. So there is a first scenario that is adaptive immune resistance. That is sort of like the best scenario you can think about. You have your tumor who's expressed in PD-L1. It's still a hot tumor. There are T cells there. And at that point, you can use on collective vector as they are. T cells are already there. You're likely to activate them. You can use them in combination with on collective vector. And you can even arm your vector with bites and furthermore improve that T cell activation. Then uh, there is a second scenario. Uh, you still have uh, T cells there, but your tumor is PDL1 negative. Now, we know that most of these viruses, uh, upon the infected cells, they trigger all these alarm signals, which in turn induce the expression of PDL1, making these PDL1 negative cells are now positive for PDL1, and now you can use immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, however, uh, those T cells by themselves, maybe they cannot get activated right away, and as a consequence, we can envision uh, to use uh, toll-like receptor agonist just to trigger a strong activation inside the tumor microenvironment and even CAR T cells. But CAR T cells, uh, in my opinion, will work really beautifully in what is probably the hugest unmet need uh, that is on your right side, uh, what we, uh, we define immunological ignorance and tolerance. In that case, the T cells are not present in the tumor microenvironment. These are the real cold tumor. And in that case, what you really have is your virus that has the potential really to uh, change the tumor microenvironment, really work like a spark create all those alarm signals that in the same way they would activate those T cells have the potential now to induce the homing of your CAR T cells into the solid tumor. Of course, you can combine both uh, uh, in those scenarios different kind of approaches. You can use also HTAC inhibitor, IDH inhibitor, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. So if you can see this oncolytic vector as a big platform that can be used in combination with classical chemo, radiotherapy, both of them, um, can be used in combination with cytokine, chemokine, immunocheckpoint inhibitor, and can even be used uh, in combination with other viral vectors. So you can use viral vector to vaccinate your patient and a different viral vector to go and tackle and kill your cancer cells. So right now, there are 141 clinical trials 
uh, using oncolytic vector, most of them are actually um, are still as a monotherapy, so just to test the safety of the vector. Uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of combinational trial going from immunocheckpoint inhibitor, uh, radiotherapy, the combination of both of them, uh, chemo, and so on. And uh, I think there are only four right now that they are, on, and three actually, they're right now in phase three clinical trial. If you look at an indication, um, I would say there is almost an equal distribution of the different solid tumor uh, in which these oncolytic vectors have been used. Uh, there is a little bit of a majority towards skin cancer, so primarily melanoma and uh, central nervous system. But other than that, it seems like um, this vector can be really tested in any solid tumor. Now, what we learn uh, from this important clinical trial that is the clinical trial with TVAC. So TVAC is an HSV vector, has been the first oncolytic vector, has been approved in the United States. And uh, the indication was melanoma. Uh, most of these patients were already uh, stage three and stage four. And um, this vector was, uh, interestingly enough, initially injected subcute in the patient. Um, and this was done for safety reasons. It was like, let's try to induce an immune response so that we can control uh, a possible varima into the tumor. And then uh, what they did, they inject the vector in eight superficial lesions, and they asked the question, what happened to the other lesion, both superficial and visceral lesion? And what they observed was that um, uh, in 2015, there was 46.1% respond in the straight injected lesion. 30% uh, respond in other superficial lesion. And only 9.4% of the visceral lesion responded to the treatment. Suggesting that this virus uh, is now, this scopal effect was really not due to the shedding of the virus from the primary lesion to the other. Instead, uh, these response were really due to the activation of the immune response, which of course was not enough to treat most of these patients. So in a second trial in 2017, uh, they combined the oncolytic vector with the anti-PD-1, uh, and what they observed this time was a rate of response of 62%, and uh, a high complete response of 33%. And um, interestingly enough, the response to this combination seemed to be independent of the baseline of CD8 positive infiltration. And uh, these are the data, these are the biopsy uh, from the lesion that were initially injected by the virus. As you can see on the upper front, uh, this is a weak one after the injection. So the red is PDL1, the green is CD8. You don't have that much of infiltration. By week six, uh, there is a robust infiltration of CD8 cells. Uh, more cancer cells start to express PDL1, and this is week 30. What is even more important uh, is what you see on your upper right side. In this case, you have injected cells and in this in, uh, in the injected lesion, sorry, and this injected lesion, you can really see uh, that the one they respond to the treatment are the one um, in which you have a really high level of density of CDA cells, something that is also clear in the uninjected cells, so in the uninjected lesion, sorry. So the uninjected lesion, they did not respond to the treatment. You don't see an infiltration of CDA cells. The one that is supposed to respond to the treatment have a high level infiltration of CDA cells. So in a similar way, um, we decided to um, tackle a different kind of tumor with a different uh, oncolytic vector. So as I said, uh, uh, there are several viruses you can use, uh, and uh, we decided to use an adenoviral vector, uh, specifically uh, for treatment in this case of bladder cancer cell, of bladder cancer. Um, the way we ensure um, the safety uh, of the virus has been by engineering the virus in such a way that it can replicate only in cancer cells by taking advantage of the high level of expression from the cancer cells of the transcription factor E2F1. And so we engineer the virus in such a way that the entire 
uh, vector replication depends on the E2F1 since we swap the endogenous promoter with the A2F1 promoter. We furthermore arm the vector with uh, GMCSF to further induce an immune response. So just to remind you about uh, E2F and why it's so important, in your normal healthy cells, you have uh, the retinoblastoma protein, RB, who normally bounds to E2F, and when that happens, uh, your cells uh, does not go in active replication and um, goes just to the regular normal division when, when it's needed. If um, RB is getting phosphorylated, now E2F is free, to bind to the DNA and start to induce uh, the replication of your cells. In cancer, what happens is uh, quite often you have mutation in RB, and by having mutation in RB, uh, you don't have any more the sequestration of E2F, and you have a total uncontrolled cell cycle um, and this is what we are taking advantage of. So we are you, taking advantage of the fact that we have these three E2F that can bind to the viral DNA and induce a strong vector replication. And between 50 to 80 percent of the cancer, liquid and solid, have uh, a mutation in the RB pathway. And it doesn't have to be just RB by itself, anything that is uh, upstream of RB as well. So mutation in P53, P53, P21, they all are going to affect uh, the RB pathway. So a little bit more about uh, what we are doing uh, and why it's different from other ways also to deliver the virus. Uh, we decided to tackle uh, bladder cancer. Is kind of a rare tumor, um, the, the incidence in the U.S. is like one case in 200,000. Um, but uh, beside the treating the patient with BCG, there is not much more that us today can be done. Uh, going through the stage of the disease, uh, it's called CIS, uh, when it's still not invasive. TA and T1 uh, is when uh, we have a papillary stage and an invasion stage, and this is called non-muscular invasive uh, bladder cancer. T2, T3, T4 are already muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. So based on this grade, uh, uh, in general, TA and T1 are already considered high grade, high grade non-muscle invasive, and then anything that is uh, above uh, T2, so T2, T3, and T4 is already defined as a muscle invasive bladder cancer. So um, when you think about the bladder cancer and you think of the bladder per se, you have a physical limitation. And uh, your physical limitation in this case is this uh, thick layer of gag, um, the glucosamine glycane, which normally really protect your bladder from the really low level of pH. Now, if you think, though, when you need to deliver uh, any kind of treatment, you have this physical barrier you need to overcome. Um, that said, uh, we uh, tested different kind of uh, uh, compound and a detergent and um, DDM, so the end of the cell, uh, beta D maltoside uh, is a really blind detergent. And even if you use an in vitro and you use a concentration of 0.1%, your cells are totally fine. Nevertheless, you really remove uh, all the physical barrier of uh, glucosamine glycane. Um, when you do so, and uh, you can think about it, our adenoviral vector doesn't have an envelope. So if you work with virus that has an envelope, for example, you cannot use this strategy, but if your viral vector doesn't have an envelope, this strategy can, is likely to really help the efficiency of infection. So what we did uh, was uh, we take, took these mice, uh, we inject them with uh, PBS, and then uh, we catheterize them and uh, inject them with the virus. This virus is pressed in like C. And as you can see, by using 10 to the 11 billion particle, we don't have that much of an infection at all into the bladder. Uh, however, by pretreating the animal with 0.1%, uh, 
of GDM. This is the concentration at 10 to the 9, this is the concentration at 10 to the 11, and you can really see that the virus can efficiently bind, infect, and express um, the reporter gene really efficiently. Um, we also uh, <laughs> use, in this case, our nude mice. So these nude mice were injected into the bladder with the uh, human bladder cells as W7 aiding, expressing luciferase. And again, we ask the question, uh, what happens if we spray the virus into the bladder of these animals? And uh, what we observed was, uh, as expected, uh, um, this was the animal um, two weeks um, after the tumor cells were injected, and these are the animal at 32 days. And our observation in this experiment was that uh, five out of eight animals actually respond to the treatment. And this is all based on the oncolysis of the virus per se, since uh, these, of course, are, are, they don't have uh, T cells or B cells, these are nude mice. So we took this, uh, um, this vector into the trial. Uh, we did a phase one clinical trial, had a really strong safety profile, and uh, then we ran a phase two clinical trial. So we enrolled 67 patients with a single arm. Uh, the inclusion criteria uh, were patients with uh, uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, all the different stages, C, C, sweet TA and T1, TA or T1 alone. And all these patients must have failed BCG. And so BCG, if you're not familiar with, is just uh, an immunotherapy is bacteria. You're going to uh, get it to the patient, which in turn can actually improve the expectancy of life of patients with, uh, with bladder cancer. So what we did, uh, we dosed the patient uh, weekly. Um, we did six injections uh, using 10 to the 12 virion particles. And we did it at uh, time zero. And uh, if uh, by month three the patient were already responding, uh, our protocol was prompting us to go to the um, six months for the second round of injection. If a month three the patient were not responding, we were prompting again, we were injecting the virus again at the month three, and then we would follow up uh, throughout the clinical trial. So the schedule of the mandatory injection would have been zero, six, 12, and 18 months. As I said, we could have the three instead of the six if uh, the patient did not respond after the first injection. All these patients were pre-treated with DDM, so you catheterize the patient, you inject the detergent, you rinse it out, and after 30 minutes, you inject the virus. Um, at three months, uh, uh, 20 of the patients did not respond after 67, and those were the patients that received, as I said, the second round of injection of the virus. So, uh, as I say, three months, uh, uh, they were zero out of 20, did not respond, didn't have a complete response. Um, upon injection of the virus again, uh, we converted these zero out of 20 in eight out of 20 responder. And these eight out of 20 were divided in cis containing seven out of 17 and papilloma only, and there were three out, one out of three. By nine months, uh, we went from eight patients uh, responding to four patients responding out of these 20 in the group. And by 12 months, uh, um, the complete response rate was three out of 20, as I said, in this specific gro group that uh, the uh, three months were not responder. Uh, so if you take though, the entire clinical trial, the situation uh, is actually quite promising. So as I said, all the patients uh, receive uh, uh, the oncolytic vector as a six round at time zero. Uh, what you have uh, in blue is the stable disease. Uh, what you have in yellow is the complete responder. Uh, what you have on this uh, dark block are the progressive disease, and that is what we observe in this uh, patient. And uh, what you have in this uh, square empty block uh, is uh, a patient for which uh, the observation is still ongoing. Uh, as you know, some of the patients really just left the trial for completely different reasons, uh, like relocation and so on, like it happened quite often. So overall, uh, three months, uh, these were our observation. Uh, 
Um, for overall, we have a 46% uh, responder at three months, uh, which uh, dropped to 45% at six months. Uh, and by 18 months, uh, we are at 23%. Uh, percent. If we look only at the cis-containing one uh, patient, we went from a 46 to a 45 to a 27, and as of 18 months, we are still like a 19%, which um, is actually really, really uh, positive data uh, in this field where normally we are below 5% at that time. Um, in terms of uh, uh, adverse event, uh, actually it was nothing uh, major. As you can see, they were primarily uh, grade one and grade two. Uh, we observe uh, uh, two grade three, um, and uh, both of the patient anyway complete uh, the, um, the entire treatment. There were three deaths though, which have been confirmed to be unrelated uh, um, with, uh, with the treatment that the patient received. I think this is really probably one of the most important slides, actually. Uh, another thing that we did uh, uh, was trying to understand uh, if uh, the uh, status of RB and uh, the status of PDL1 uh, would have worked as a biomarker in terms of a patient that would have respond or not respond to the treatment. So in the upper left side, uh, what you have uh, is uh, the example of uh, tumor in which uh, uh, RB is not phosphorylated. Uh, so certain lab behaviors like your healthy tissue, they're not permissive to vector replication. And these are all pre, uh, pre oncolytic vector treatment. Uh, these are biopsy, which on the middle side is when you have an intermediate uh, level of expression uh, of, uh, of a phosphorylated RB. And on your right side, uh, you have a higher level of phosphorylation. So as you can see on your bottom left, uh, um, we can really look and ask the question, what is really happening throughout the clinical trial? So you can see that the complete responder are here on, uh, on your bottom left. Um, in the first part, when you have low level of expression of uh, uh, RB, what you're observing is uh, your complete responder are 33%. You have stable disease in 44%, and you have no responder at 27%. And just to go to the extreme uh, that is on the other side, uh, um, in uh, the case in which the patient, the biopsy, re the biopsy re revealed high levels of phosphorylation of uh, RB, now all of those patients fully respond to the treatment. Regarding PDL1, uh, we also have a really similar finding. So interestingly enough, uh, if we have low level, uh, in patients that have really low level of PDL1, we observe 30% uh, um, complete respond. Uh, in patients that start with a high level of PDL1, uh, we already observe, uh, uh, we observe roughly 70% of the complete responder, suggesting that um, probably we were facing, in both cases, a relatively hot tumor, and that uh, the, um, the engineering of our vector is really efficacious since we confirmed that the vector can efficiently replicate and infect all in cancer cells. We also took bad, um, this vector back uh, to the lab, and we asked the question, uh, uh, beside bladder cancer, uh, which other indication we can tackle, and also in terms of working in, uh, and thinking about combinational treatment. So as you may know, most of these oncology vectors, one of the major limitations, they do not replicate in murine cells. So we use this model, this genetic model called KLN205, uh, as a mouse squamous cell carcinoma. We inject the animal at day one uh, in the flank, and by uh, roughly uh, five days, uh, we inject the, um, the animal in contralateral side. We wait another uh, 10 days or so, and then uh, we treat the animal uh, with either anti-CTL4, with the oncolytic vector expressing the murine GMCSF, that is called uh, A20104, the combination of the oncolytic vector and anti-CTLA4, anti-PDL1 by itself, combination vector anti-PDL1, both immunocheck point inhibitor, and then the combination of the three. 
So as I said, this vector does not replicate in these cancer cells. However, it's highly metastatic and we could count the number of metastases into the lung. Um, and if we knew, and we knew that if uh, there was an effect on the lung metastasis, it means uh, that we were really inducing the strong immune response that we were looking for. So on the, on the first column, what you have is no treatment. We counted roughly uh, 15 uh, metastases in the lung of the animals. All the animals that received um, anti-CTL4 or the double, uh, or sorry, the single treatment, um, anti-PD-1 by itself, or the vector with anti-CTL4, we counted roughly an average of five uh, lung metastases. What was really quite striking was to see that the vector that is the last one um, in combination with the two on immunotrepoint inhibitor uh, provide a count of uh, 0.9 overall number of uh, metastases per mouse uh, compared to the 14, suggesting the, the strong induction immune response. I'm not going to spend too much time out of this, but we tested this vector in so many other indications, and here is a different way to present uh, in which uh, our vector is likely, which indication our vector is likely uh, to work. So colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, of course, sarcoma, um, hepatocarcinoma, and pancreatic cancer. So where we are right now, um, as I said, we finish uh, the phase two clinical trial. We are going for a phase three clinical trial with our own collective vector uh, as a single agent. Um, in combination with Merck, uh, we're going to start a phase two clinical trial uh, in combination with anti-PD-1, uh, and uh, we are also planning, uh, it's called the Covina trial, in which we're going to tackle different solid tumor indication. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you. Thank you especially for the patients and their family, and thanks you for the entire Cold Genesis team that is uh, working time, you see, and uh, um, really to really uh, improve and uh, uh, get this vector, uh, uh, being able to just treat not just bladder cancer patients, but all the patients with uh, other different kinds of solid tumor. Thank you so much.